Hello everyone, welcome to Theory of Architecture. My guest today is Mark Foster Gage. Mark is an American architect, writer, and theorist based in New York City, where he runs his practice, Mark Foster Gage Architects. He is an associate professor at the Yale School of Architecture, where his academic focus is on aesthetic philosophy. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Mark Foster Gage, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to have you on. Um, there's a whole load of topics I want to get into, but the title of your new book, and a term you use quite a lot, is high resolution architecture mm -hmm. or architecture in high resolution. Can you explain what exactly it is that you mean by architecture in high resolution? I can try. Um, that... Uh title came from a debate I had in architecture at the Cooper Union a number of years ago with uh, Michael Meredith of Moss office here in New York. And my friend Michael Young kind of organized this debate to be low resolution versus high resolution. And I hadn't really thought about the term beforehand. Michael had just done an exhibition at Princeton called 44 low resolution houses. And uh, I was intended to come from the opposite position. And what I started to articulate then and why I named the book what I did is, is that I feel that architecture has had a trajectory, particularly within the 20th century, of moving increasingly more and more towards abstraction. And what that means is, in a sense, that it's easier and easier to build architecture, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but it also means that the architecture that's being built is increasingly being dictated by software programs and available materials. So I've said elsewhere that architecture is becoming a discipline not of design, but of product picking. And I believe that can like best be illustrated if you think about how most architecture firms design their work in a, a 3D program, in particular, like a, a BIM modeling program like Revit, essentially it's, the art of what I call pushing around boxes. And then essentially you're dragging and dropping, you know, corporate curtain wall products, corporate facade products onto these surfaces. So in doing that, you're limited to really designing at the scale of what you've seen on the screen. And it's very rare that people, you know, zoom in more and more and more and design at the scale of what you might call historic architecture. So in a, you know, kind of glass, let's say a glass, there's a number of projects in New York City, these glass towers that grow up that are like five stacked boxes, each with a slightly different curtain wall, you know, and there's like slight cantilevers and that's mistaken as design. But you see that building from far away and you get up close and there's there's no difference looking at up close than, you, than, than there is far away. Like you don't, when you get closer to the building, more detail is not revealed more detail is hidden because they want to hide the joints and just show the flush curtain wall. And my frustration with that is that architecture, or my worry is that architecture has kind of forgotten about a certain scale of design. And when we're just dragging and dropping corporate curtain wall products onto BIM boxes and calling that architecture, that our architecture moves and quote, are just being limited to pushing a couple boxes so they're cantilevered or drag, drag and dropping different different products but if you look at a historic building when you walk up to it there's more detail around let's say the main entrance maybe on the division between the first floor and the piano nobile maybe at the top there's some additional detail certainly the new york city history of the skyscraper is one that you would articulate the base with more detail and then you would have a repeated series of elements that lead to a top that you then articulate with more detail all of that's been erased in favor of like the kind of glass box that just starts and ends the same. Um, so that's basically what I mean. It's like, how do we return architecture to a level of higher resolution? You know, when you're looking at your computer screen and you zoom into an image and it pixelates, that's a low resolution image. If you're on your computer screen and you zoom in and you keep zooming in and you can see more and more detail, 
that's a high resolution image. And the reason I use that term high resolution is to make that distinction that if we zoom in farther to our buildings, can we get back to a level of detail that's not necessarily historic detail, that's not just reapplying ornament uh, as we have in the past, but can we recover that level of detail to allow our buildings to have more maybe cultural value, maybe regional value, maybe uh, articulate a better sense of identity for the community. So things don't continue to become so abstract and meaningless. Mm. It's very interesting seeing how you define that in terms of um, as, as high resolution, because it sounds exactly the same concept to me as what Nikos Salangaros calls structural order. It's that mm. fractal scaling up and down the, uh, the order of, um, of scales of having actual design elements at the macro level, the meso level and the micro level. Uh, and everything in between and yeah. that obviously brings into the fold the idea of ornament at the the smaller scale so your work takes seems to take a particular approach to ornament using a lot of what what i sort of would call almost an electronic sort of fractal aesthetic um so how how is it that you come to settle on the the particular uh approach that you have to that micro level detail that high resolution detail as you put it why do you make those decisions in the way that you do yeah so i was i was educated as a classical architect so i spent i don't know 15 or 20 years of my life in the world of classical architecture you know doric ionic corinthian when i was in college I literally was in architecture school and I had a semester long studio dedicated to the Doric, a semester to the Ionic, a semester to the Corinthian. And part of learning in that tradition is that you learn in these multiple scales simultaneously. Meaning that you spend as much time as you would on a doorway as you would the massing of the building. And I like to think of that as how I do my work. I mean, we'll talk about, we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but I'm pretty heavily involved in the, the philosophical movement of speculative realism. And one of the ideas that comes from that discourse is the idea of a flat ontology. And in philosophical terms, a flat ontology is where everything is given equal weight. So a human is has the same amount of value as a toaster, has the same amount of value as a frog. And it's a way that philosophers, in particular in ecological theory, um, try to come up with a framework of the world that doesn't necessarily have the human at the center, where we start to give other entities a kind of value. But the idea that the takeaway from that is just the term flat ontology, which I'm going to use, which again is that equalization of entities. And if you, if you think of a flat ontology with architecture, uh, it would be that classical idea of design, where you're spending as much time on the doorway and the column capital as you do the massing. I've always had a like a kind of bristling reaction against the term ornament because it's always been understood as architecture as the thing that you do after you've done everything else. Like you design the building, you lay out the plan, you do the facade, and then you just tack on these, you know, angel's wings and acanthus leaves. And it's kind of like decorative sprinkles on the architecture. And the way we think about it in our work is that we, we don't, we try not to use the word ornament just because it's so, is so charged within architecture, you know, with Adolf Loos saying ornament is a crime and uh, Le Corbusier saying super offensive things about thinking about architecture aesthetically and material as the domain of peasants and savage races. Like there's this horrible backlash in architecture against that term in particular ornament as being like frilly and feminine and unnecessary and so we think of it in our work, in our office, as uh, something with equal importance to programming and massing. And that's, that's how we operate within this kind of flat ontology. The question for us then is, how do you design it, right? So for 2000 years, you know, plus or minus the dark ages, classical architecture through antiquity into the Renaissance, into the enlightenment, neoclassicism, there was a language which was set which had this level of detail uh, already inscribed within the architectural system. So you can't do classicism without that level of detail. It's just part of the, the stuff. Now, how do you use that attitude towards 
that level of detail if you're not going to lose use classicism. It becomes tricky because, you know, what do you do? Do you replace the Ionic capital with uh, a transformer or, a, you know, a semi-trailer or like a piece of corn? What do you do? Uh, that doesn't seem particularly reasonable or fruitful. So what my office has started to do over the last 10 or 15 years is just look for other avenues that allow us access to higher resolution languages for architecture. So one direction has been through mathematics and in particularly looking at fractals. Uh, I was able to fortunately have some really interesting conversations about the relationship between architecture and fractals at Yale with uh, Benoit Mendelbrot, who is of course British, but was the inventor of the fractal trying to calculate the coastline of England uh, in World War II. Like, how, how do you calculate the, calculate the coastline of England? Do you average it together? Do you take every nook or do you take every rock? Depending on how you measure it, you can either get, you know, a reasonable length or you can get 10 times that length. And a fractal was originally trying to understand how you can measure something with increasingly le increasing levels of detail um, without having to design all those levels of detail. So we use fractals at multiple scales to generate exactly that type of high resolution reading. So projects in our office that you could find on our website that use those strategies are things like a project for the um, National Science, uh, National Center for Science and Innovation in Lithuania, which is our, probably our first project that we used fractals. Another project where we tried to develop a different language for a high resolution architecture was uh, we did a tower on West 57th Street, which got a lot of press, which was using objects and elongating them, just kind of random objects that we were just cutting and stretching, only using for their formal and detail properties, not for their symbolic properties. And the most recent way we've been generating high resolution architecture is through the use of artificial intelligence. So we've been doing a number of projects uh, in the Middle East and taking historic patterns from different civilizations in the era, in the areas, and using artificial intelligence to blend them together with contemporary patterns to get these very strange um, artificial intelligence derived patterns that we, in a sense, extrude into architecture. And an example of that on our website would be our, uh, there's a resort in the Middle East project, which was largely produced using that method of artificial intelligence. So there's not a one size fits all strategy. We're trying multiple strategies to develop multiple languages of architecture that already have that level of detail in it. So it's not just something where we're designing a building and applying something else to it, but the detail is already there. And that's, it's proven difficult, which is why we spend so much time designing and experimenting. That book, which I actually just got an advanced copy of here, the one you refer to, architecture in high resolution, product plug. Uh, <laughs> it'll be available, for a shameless plug it'll be available in August, but <laughs> this is a 500 page book, all documenting uh, one project. And it just goes through like all of the processes we use to create all these different languages. So you can't imagine a less profitable architectural project <laughs> so than you developing just, just quickly 500 on pages to generate all these different levels of detail it's all <laughs> trial and error because no one's done it before yeah so in in very briefly I've, I've experimented a little bit on this are you sort of using fractal generation programs and putting them through something like grasshopper and then sort of flushing them out the other end into rhino and something like that um we've form? been using ironically or not ironically but strangely we were using mathematic programs including mathematica to generate fractals and then they were so complex that we had to use a medical MRI software that slices a model and it would slice it into like infinitely thin pancakes, like thousands of little pancakes. We have to import those into a 3D modeling program uh, like Mesh Mixer or uh, ZBrush, something that can handle a lot of polygons. It's really hard to get it into Rhino because Rhino just isn't built for that level of resolution. Um, so we've had to circumvent architectural software, which is something I always like doing because one of my biggest worries is that architecture that's designed with software is limited to the tools that those software providers provide. Uh, so I always feel like we're onto something when we can't do it in Rhino. 
which is half of our board, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you're sort of you're literally using fractals, whereas sort of the the principle of using fractals and self similarity more generally can be done without any form of fractal or mathematical generating software, like with Gothic cathedrals, for example, which obviously would be done using a pencil. Um, yeah. Like it's the same principle of using self similarity of forms and, and structures to to create this sort of fractal sense, even if it's not directly generated through an algorithm in the way that you would do it. The, th the thing about fractals is that they're, you know, a recursive fractal, like you see on a screensaver for, you know, Windows PC or something. They're actually really boring because you just zoom in and you see the same thing over and over and over. And that's part of their magic. You know, it's totally mysterious and you can just go on forever. Uh, but what's interesting about architecture is you can freeze those moments and you can show some of them at a large scale and some of them at a small scale simultaneously, which is something you can't really do with a fractal, which is contingent on you moving in and out of it. So we're taking some of those languages from these fractals and showing them at larger and smaller scale simultaneously which gives you different resolutions in the same form, which is something a fractal as you would see on a computer screen really isn't capable of doing because the zooming is done either through animation or with your mouse. Whereas in architecture, we can just zoom it up and zoom it down and freeze it, which is how we're trying to get these different readings. So fractals have been used in architecture since antiquity. I mean, the Greek antiquity, you know, the architects of ancient Greece were particularly interested in forms like the, you know, the golden rectangle, which is, you know, a, a recursive fractal that generates things like nautilus shells and flowers and spirals. So they knew about this. They knew about recursion and fractals. Uh, they just couldn't use the three-dimensional complexity that comes with them. They could only use the proportions that established them in a sense. Yeah. So yeah, there's a million different ways to use fractals. We just try to find the ways that allow us to use them in what you might call, I don't know, all of their three-dimensional glory at multiple scales simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, there is so, there's often something very uh, grotesque almost about what was, comes out of uh, sort of fractal generating forms, I think. And you can look like you're inside a, some kind of, sort of Victorian grotto or something. And yeah. you almost have to temper that down and take the, sure. the principle without sort of letting the the pure mathematics be overwhelming yeah no it's true i mean the the irony is that like you can't technically design fractals to make architecture because everything gets too small like architecture has a limit to how small you can have things you know you can't build things the size of a pixel you can't build things i mean you can't really build much in architecture smaller than an inch you know so if you think about how much an inch covers on your computer screen with a fractal, you know, there's like infinite number of worlds in that inch, but architecture has to stop somewhere. So I think you have to be pretty heavy handed. And I think this is a good point for the, the podcast is that we use these tools, but we never use them just out of they come as they come out of the computer. Like we're designing with them. We're taking our hands and we're messing with them and rearranging them and scaling them it's not like the computer is just spitting out these things that we use, but we're heavily, heavily manipulating in them and curating them through, you know, just the human mind and the human hand. So they're not, there's no argument in my work that the computer can design something without the involvement of humankind. Uh, we use it all as source material to design and compose maybe as architects would have done a thousand years ago. Like this piece looks better, bigger. Let's shrink that one down. Maybe this one should be red. So I'm a, I'm, let's say I'm a big fan of human involvement <laughs> in the architectural design yeah. process. And well, I know there's been a lot of movements against that in recent years. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, someone on site has to attach one thing to another thing with their own hands. So it's got to be buildable by real people in the real world. Um, right. You mentioned flat ontology. Uh, ontology is a rabbit hole that I went down a couple of years ago and find it incredibly fascinating. What do you mean by a flat ontology? Okay, so within philosophy, which is a kind of discourse that I've been 
involved in for I don't know 20 years or so. I, I'm I'm in regular touch with a number of philosophers, like Graham Harmon, who is the father of object-oriented ontology. Uh, he was just named, I think, one of the 10 most influential philosophers of the last decade. Uh, a couple of years ago, I taught a studio with him at Yale. Um, he just wrote the forward to this book, Architecture in High Resolution. So I've always bounced ideas off people within philosophy um, because I find it more interesting to talk to philosophers than to talk to architectural theorists. Uh, <laughs> this is a distinction we can maybe talk about later, but I'm way more interested in philosophy than I am theory. And again, that's a distinction we can talk about later, but the, the, just a kind of primer for your audience within philosophy, there's only a couple of branches of philosophy. There's uh, ontology, which is the nature of being, which is why are things the way they are. There's epistemology, which is the nature of knowledge, which is how do we know things are the way they are. And then there's the most recent branch aesthetics, which is how do we perceive things the way they are. So ontology has actually been really out of fashion in, in philosophical circles for the last number of centuries in favor of epistemology. The argument being that we can never understand the nature of a thing. We can only understand our knowledge of that thing. Uh, Object-oriented ontology is kind of a re resurgence or resurrection of the subject matter of ontology within philosophy. So it's controversial, it's kind of newer, it's, I think, more speculative, it's, it's more, has more influence on the arts, I would say, these days. But ontology, just to start with, is the nature of being. Uh, and a flat ontology is how we place beings or entities in relationship to one another. Historically, since the Renaissance, the model, the ontological model of the universe has been, there's the human at the middle and the human understands everything else in the world, but the human is the most important thing. Before the Renaissance, it was God. So in the dark ages, um, it wasn't human's job to understand things. It was God's job to understand things, which is why you didn't have a lot of literacy or a lot of accurate representation in the Middle Ages, because it wasn't human's job to understand things. It was God's job to understand things. The Renaissance was a reposition of that, where it mattered what the human, how humans understand things, which is why the term humanism is so linked with the Renaissance. It's a recentering of the universe around the human. And you can see that in everything from astronomy where you know the earth was the center of the universe until the enlightenment uh, to the use of perspective in the renaissance where it would perspective is the calculation of reality according to how it would perceive be perceived by the human eye so everything was human centered and this has been very good <laughs> for science for enlightenment for architecture it gave humans the ability to think about the world in the context of their own needs, not God's needs so much. It solved multiple problems, but it's had, for instance, disastrous consequences for the environment. Because if the center of the universe or the center of the world is human activity, then that privileges human activity all over all other things that happen on the planet. So this human-centered idea, this human-centered ontology is what's responsible for our current climate crisis. Okay? Because we, we feel that you know, we deserve to take these things out of the world. It doesn't matter if other animals become extinct. It's all about the survival of us and our species as the most important species. So it turns out with all the benefits that humanism brought, it also brought these after effects of essentially destroying the environment. Why philosophers think about the world in terms of a flat ontology is just to say, hey, wait a minute, like humanism's great. Uh, we still know humans are important. What would happen if we just thought about everything being equal and humans no longer being the center of the universe, but just being one category of beings or entities among an infinite number of beings and categories? So what happens when we don't put the human at the privileged center of everything, 
but allow the human to have equal value to everything else. And that has really profound consequences for architecture, because what does that mean for architecture? If you're not only thinking about architecture as housing humans, you start to think about how architecture uh, houses things like non-human entities or how it impacts the environment. So it's had a huge impact on um, environmental thinking. And I think it's starting to have a really big impact on architectural thinking as we think about architecture having more consequences than only human comfort. So that's that's a flat ontology in a, a nutshell. A flat ontology doesn't say that humans are the same as everything else. Like a human isn't the same as a dump truck. Uh, dump trucks don't perceive, dump trucks don't talk, dump trucks don't build their own housing. Uh, neither do deer or fish or potatoes, right? So it's not saying that all these things are the same, but it's saying, what if we think of everything as having equal value only as a starting point for other ways of thinking and behaving? So it's not intended to say humanity is worthless. It's just intended to reposition our relationship to everything else in the world, just to give us a new framework through which to see the world. And I find that very exciting because the history of architecture in particular in, in the 20th century was largely defined by different styles and things looking very different. So you have a, a modernist house or you had the house for Vanna Venturi, which is a postmodernist house, or you have a deconstructivist house or you have a kind of blobby house that, that the, the way you identified change in architecture was through its shape and look. I find the idea of a flat ontology very exciting because it asks architecture to change not its look, but its underlying assumptions, which is why architects who are interested in ontology or object-oriented ontology or flat ontology, none of their work looks the same. It's not like a style. It's, I, think, I think of it as, you know, if you have a computer and you have a software program which manipulates form, the ontological shift in architecture isn't just a new software program, it's a new operating system for the computer, which is why it doesn't have observable and identifiable formal results, but it's having a big impact on architecture through making architects think through very different ways about how architecture might operate in this flat onto ontological world. Well, it's, I find that absolutely fascinating you refer to it as a flat ontology because I think you're describing exactly the same thing I think of what I'm for me it's very much about the the sort of the, the mathematical ontological basis of the universe and everything that's within it and that the, the universe is a series of systems that are defined in all likelihood mathematically and that a an entity whether that's a human or a building or a thing that we perceive to be an entity you can't really define in any meaningful sense where the edges of that entity are because like where does a human end does the human include the system that uh feeds the human that keeps the human alive does it include the environment that creates the food that keeps the human alive does it include the food that lives off the dead human at the other end after the human decomposing in the ground like there's a there's a like when you when you say a flat ontology to me it's part of the sort of the block universe idea of, um, of of a general continuum of existence of which we are one iteration amongst an infinite number of iterations within a sort of uh, an infinity of complex interactions. You are a, you are a, a very hardcore delusion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that that's an idea. No, that's a really great it's a really great observation because it allows me to talk a little bit more about um, about that ontology in a more specific way. Uh, that that has been an idea that's dominated, I would say, architectural theory for maybe thirty or forty years, and Deleuze had an important role in that. and And that is the idea that, like this, this I'm holding up a water bottle for your audience that is maybe listening and not viewing, or a a, a bottle of green tea, and Deleuze would, would say, just to simplify, that this isn't uh, a plastic bottle. This is some molecules that used to be gas that are on their way to becoming some other molecules, and you're just freezing it in this frame of time, and it happens to be a plastic bottle. So that's the idea that everything is interconnected, and we're just taking snapshots of things. And that's useful for thinking about 
the world in an interconnected way. It's terrible for thinking of architecture and aesthetic or the world in an aesthetic way because it doesn't allow you to have objects. So let's just take that idea where everything is either part of a system or a network or a snapshot in time. And just look at the other side of the equation, which is object-oriented ontology. Object-oriented ontology says, okay, that system where everything is defined by the network in which it's enmeshed, it doesn't allow you to talk about the object. It only allows you to talk about the system. But we know, like you said, humans are enmeshed in the system of ecology from which they're born and they're fed and nourished and they evaporate and cells replace. But at the same time, a human being is an entity that you could draw a silhouette around and say that is a human, right? So object-oriented ontology is a movement in philosophy that tries to give us access to that, uh, an object, an object independent of the system in which it's enmeshed. That isn't to say it's not enmeshed as a system, but it gives us a way within philosophy to talk about objects, which philosophy hasn't had for maybe two or three centuries because objects have always been thought as systems. The systems that describe objects in philosophy are usually epistemological systems like uh, you, you wouldn't be able to describe this plastic bottle in the world of philosophy. The only way you could describe this, philosophy, this plastic bottle within philosophy in the last few centuries to kind of simplify is to say, my human mind is a couple of chemicals which are seeing this and this is doesn't really exist. I can't prove the existence of this thing. All I can say that it's part of some system of my mind that's perceiving a plastic bottle right now. So that allows us to talk about the mind and the perception of the mind and the chemicals in the mind, but it doesn't allow us to talk about the reality of the object because you can't prove the reality of the object in historic philosophy since Descartes. Object-oriented ontology says two things, three things. It says objects exist. Uh, there's one way to destroy the ex existence of an object, which is called undermining, which is to say that this isn't really an object. It's really not a plastic bottle. It's really just a bunch of molecules. And those molecules are uh, governed by physics. So you're not really looking at an object. You're looking at a bunch of little molecules bouncing around or you're looking at a bunch of neurons firing in your head. That's called undermining because you're kind of going at a smaller scale. There's another thing called overmining, which is saying this isn't really a water bottle or plastic bottle. It's actually part of ecology uh, that's constantly changing. And it was gas and soon it's gonna be in a landfill and then it's gonna be bacteria food uh, that you're saying it's not really an object because of some larger system of this a part of. So undermining and overmining are what philosophy has done historically and object oriented ontology is a philosophical movement that focuses on the existence of the object as an independent object, uh, independent of those overmined and undermined relations. That doesn't mean to say that it doesn't exist, but we have to be able to talk about this as an object, especially if we're architects and we're gonna talk about architecture as built things. Uh, because you can't design a building that's gonna address all the networks of the world. We have to be able to talk about a building. And my particular interest is, is in aesthetics. And if we're gonna talk about aesthetics, we have to be able to talk about independent entities and their impact on communities and people. So I think, I think what you talked about with mathematics is a good example of overmining and undermining. And I think those have proven very fruit, fruitful in philosophy and architecture, but a lot of architects are interested in object or in ontology because it gives us the ability to philosophically deal with independent en entities, which is, I think maybe why we're talking on your architectural theory podcast, because it's a new position in architecture, one that has, you know, really given a number of my peers and I new ideas about how to produce the architecture that we're producing. Yeah, no, I think I've, probably came to the same conclusion or they called it different things a while ago because I, I was going down as I say this rabbit hole of ontology and realized towards the end that like you say at the end of the day you have to deal with effectively aesthetics with a building with objects with the sort of the, the real politique of what's in front of you and that 
the sort of the value in dealing with those things practically, you're going to get more value out of that than excessively undermining or overmining, as you say, um, with the sort of topics that you're trying to do on a more academic level. Like ultimately, or as architects, we're creating buildings and they have aesthetic effects um, yep. and, to, and to some degree systematic effects at a, at a sort of societal level and ecological level, of course. Um, and that dealing with those in the way that you say, in a, with an object-oriented ontology is much better than sort of going down the, the excessively theoretical, um, pro- probably endless rabbit hole of, of, uh, of undermining and overmining and, and the other approaches that you've, as you've mentioned. Right. And I think that's been one of the frustrations of architecture, in particular in the 20th century, that, you know, modernism had multiple ambitions, one of which was, you know, kind of internationally democratic style that would not offend anyone and not privilege anyone. But what you got with that, you know, so that that's an overmining idea, right? I'm going to design an architecture that addresses human equality throughout the globe, you know? So this little thing called architecture has to do a lot of work. And uh, that's why those architects designed in a way that conceptually addressed that larger goal. So for instance, Mies van der Rohe's new gallery in Berlin, you know, just an open flat roof with an open space. You see all of the city, a kind of, there's no hierarchy. That, that building reflects that concept of an overarching equality among all humans really well. But aesthetically, and this is going to generate some controversy, but I would say aesthetically, Mises' work to anyone except architects doesn't have particularly favorable aesthetic qualities. Like an architect will walk into Mises' gallery, drop their (laughs) drop to their knees and worship. But if my mom walks into the new gallery, she'll be like, "This is a really nice Walmart," you know. Yeah. Well, that brings us nicely onto the favorite topic of architects in this country which is the difference in opinion between architects and the architectural establishment on what is good architecture and the general public on what is good architecture uh, and this is a particular concern in our country because we've got a or had a commission called the building beautiful commission which was effectively the government trying to define what beauty is um and trying to come up with ways of mandating it effectively uh, in the built environment and architects in the architect prof- architectural profession quite uh, understandably got quite upset with this uh, because a lot of it was to do with traditionalism and and sort of reviving the as you mentioned with your classical education the neoclassical and neo-georgian especially in this country um, buildings and styles that perhaps are not the most favored choice of much of the architectural establishment so how do you see do you agree for a start that there is a a disparity between what the public likes and what the architectural establishment likes and what architects like uh and yeah. what, what can we do about it and wh- where does the problem lie and what can we do about it what should we do about it all right let's be just for the sake of like more clicks let's be really controversial about this <laughs> let's say that let's say that a government wants a new type of architecture that's more aesthetically accessible to the public, right? That's enjoyed by the public. And that was, I think the goal of, I don't know much about your building beautiful movement, but I do know about the Prince of Wales and the kind of push to traditional architecture. So there's the abstract idea, which is a government wants better buildings and cities for its people. And I don't think anyone would have a problem with that, right? I think what people have a problem with is the government saying the only way to produce better buildings and cities for its people is to use Georgian historic styles or to use Gothic architecture. Or So I think the ambitions of the government, like even having that ambition is a good thing. I think articulating how it's done is a bad thing. So this may come as a surprise. Uh, I mean, I'm generally considered pretty progressive on the architectural front, both theoretically and in terms of our work. We're often, I'm often invited to talk at, about innovation and at like innovation conferences and things like that. 
Um, but I've also, like I said, been educated as a classical architect at Yale. I'm, I'm, I'm personal friends with Leon Creer, who built Poundbury and was the Prince of Wales, like chief architect for the last two decades. I taught a studio with Leon Creer at uh, Yale a number of years ago. I'm friends with Dimitri Porfirios, who's done work on Buckingham Palace and a number of classical projects around the UK and internationally. So I know that point of view. Um, I don't agree that the only way, so we have that desire, the government wants better, beautiful, more built, more beautiful, more accessible, more humane, more livable cities for its people. I'm in full agreement that a government can want that. I'm in full agreement that the government should find architects to provide that. I'm in total disagreement that the only way to fulfill that is by hiring traditional architects. But having said that, and this is where I'm gonna get into a lot of trouble, I'm gonna say because architects have been trained in this abstracted modernist milieu for generations, the ability to do architecture that has the same qualities as those traditional projects has been lost in architecture. This is a short way of saying that the government wants to produce a new genre of buildings that the architectural community is no longer capable of producing, which is why the government is turning to traditional architecture because there's no competition among contemporary architecture. It's almost uniformly ugly. And I am an expert in aesthetics and I do not shy away from using terms like ugly and uh, beautiful, although I, don't, I can't tell you how to produce them. I can tell you when I go to Houston, Texas, that it's a ugly city. And I can tell you where I go to Paris, it's a beautiful city. And I can tell you when I go to London, it's somewhere in between. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, I mean, architects know, we should be able to talk about aesthetics. I mean, aesthetics hasn't been taught in architecture schools for over a hundred years. So it's not a big surprise that we're really bad at it. And when the government asks for something like that, of course, it's threatening to the entire architectural establishment in the UK because they don't know how to do it. Like, they don't know how to deliver on what they're being asked. If they could produce something which was as aesthetically, let's say, enjoyed by the public as a Georgian town, then the government would go with that. But architects in the UK and the US are mostly producing corporate, I don't know, crap that produces shitty cities with shitty urban environments. So that isn't to say that there's not individual buildings, which are fantastic. I think like some of the best architects in the world right now are British architects doing incredible individual buildings, but taken as a whole, contemporary cities, either in the UK or the US, are mostly, you know, shite, <laughs> to put it in British terms. And the establishment doesn't know what to do because they only have a limited palette of tools which they've been taught. And this, I think, is the logjam between what regular humans want and what architects are capable of giving and what architects like and what regular humans like. They're different things. Yeah, well, I think the key point you said in there for me is the qualities of architecture that traditional architecture has. It's not that we as architects need to learn to reproduce classical columns and all the traditional styles or anything like for like. Um, and I think those things would rightly, if that were to happen, would they would be rightly dismissed as pastiche or uninventive there's a time and a place of course but generally but you're right to say that learning to produce buildings that have the same qualities as traditional buildings but aren't in traditional styles is yeah. the key point and that you're and I right think the key to that is resolution mm. because if you look at those traditional buildings what i talked about when we started the podcast was the ability for a building to produce different things as you move closer or farther away if I move closer or farther away to an Inigo Jones house or a Lechens house, you know, there's details, there's more details, there's more resolution. The same thing is also true in, you know, British Parliament, you know, kind of your Ruskinian Gothic, uh, which has nothing to do with Georgian architecture, but it has also has a high degree of changes in resolution. 
I think the problem with contemporary architecture is that we just don't have the tools to produce changes in resolution. And I think that's something that's embedded in the human desire to perceive things, which is why I think people, when they go to London, they take pictures of Parliament and Big Ben because they want to capture something beautiful or human about that building. And they don't take pictures of Norman Foster's, you know, Bloomberg headquarters because it doesn't have that same beauty or change in resolution. Now I'm an architect. I love Norman Foster. I, Norman Foster went to Yale where I've been teaching for 20 years. I think he's done some incredible things. I think that's a really awesome building, super expensive. I love a lot about it, but I know when people walk by it, they're not photographing it because it doesn't resonate at multiple scales of resolution. That's not to say it's a bad building. I think it's a great building, but it's not, I don't think ever going to be a beloved building. Uh, and I think, you know, it's such a cheesy thing to say, but I think architects should get back into the business of producing beloved, beloved buildings, but trying to find ways to do so in contemporary languages. And that's in essence, the entire description of what we're trying to do in my office, which is not by any means a call to historic forms. We're not using columns. We're not using capitals. We're not using pitched roofs. We're not using arches. We're not using advocating for Gothic. We're not advocating for Georgian. We're not advocating for you know anything in particular, but one cannot deny that there are aesthetic qualities when one walks through Paris that present themselves that do not present themselves when one walks through Houston, Texas. I don't think anyone would. And that isn't to say that architecture can't be challenging. I just don't think all architecture needs to be challenging all the time. Yeah. Well, I think the the comparison between European cities and American cities is a difficult one because you've got so many, the urban planning differences are so much bigger. Like that's that to me is almost the overriding problem before you even get to the building scale. Yeah. Um, but I found this in some, for example, like Dutch suburbs where you've got the beauty of the center of Amsterdam, but then on the same street plan, there's some yeah. modernist suburbs in Amsterdam, which are frankly horrific. Yeah. No, true. It, because yeah. I mean that, that, that ambition to produce contemporary abstraction was global. It hit the UK just as hard as it hit the U S and I'm, I'm guessing that all of those areas, when you're in Antwerp or Paris, even going out to La Défense, the good parts of the cities or like the, let's say the aesthetically beloved parts of cities are more often than not the parts that were produced before 1920 and the parts which are more challenging, which are more contemporary, but maybe not as loved except by architects are the ones produced after 1920. So there's, you know, similarly nice parts in the U S and, you know, no country has a lock on good or bad urbanism or architecture, but I would say that in general, the most loved buildings and parts of cities are the ones that happened before 1920 and the move towards abstraction. I mean, abstraction, modernism promoted abstraction. Abstraction is the removal of resolution, right? And I'm advocating for high resolution, which is just another say of moving away from abstraction, because I think there's something in the human psyche that desires perceiving things at multiple levels of resolution. So I shall ask you about clients, persuading clients in a minute, but first about architectural education and architectural, the architectural establishment and its attitudes. Mm -hmm. How do you go about changing the attitudes and the therefore the working practices and I suppose the skill set of an entire generation of architects. The same way the modernists did it. You know, I mean, it started with a couple of people. Uh, those people wrote. I mean, one of the key things that modernists did wasn't just architecture, was that they wrote about their ideas and they pushed them into the world and they had symposia about it and they tried to press along their message. Uh, the modernists were not passive about their beliefs. And I think one of the reasons I write, you know, and I've written a number of books and I continue to write is that I think change comes from not only doing what you're talking about, but talking about what you're doing. 
which is why I'm having a podcast conversation with you, which is why, I, you know, just gave a lecture in North Carolina last week and why I, you know, before COVID fly all over the place and, and give lectures is that there's a number of architects emerging today, mostly under 50, uh, mostly interested in these ideas about ontology and aesthetics that I've been talking to you about, that believe in what they're doing, that do what they're talking about in their work, and that write and that lecture and that are trying to change minds. I've been teaching at Yale for 20 years, uh, believe it or not, it seems rather impossible. Um, but for all those 20 years, I've been talking about and teaching classes involving the philosophical idea of aesthetics. And aesthetics hasn't been taught in architecture since before World War I. Um, over those years, I've had over a thousand students at Yale. And if 10 of those students take some of those aesthetic ideas and teach about them or practice with them and impact 10 others and impact 10 others, that the only way change occurs in any discipline or anywhere in the world is indeed by number of people who impact other people who impact other people. So obviously I'm not gonna get the commission for thousands of buildings and change the world individually, but I think a number of people who say, look, our urban environments, turns out these really awesome ideas from modernism, that we're in love with, like democracy and industrial efficiency and affordability and function, all these awesome ideas of modernism actually produce really shitty cities. So let's take those ambitions and see if we can find new ways of achieving them through rethinking our languages that we're deploying. And I think that's more important than ever because in 2016, it was kind of a big year for humanity in that that's the year that more people on earth lived in cities than rural environments, which means, and I say this kind of hyperbolically, but I also mean it to be true that architecture historically has been the discipline that produced shelters within nature and shelters are supposed to protect you from nature, but nature is the main thing in the world, right? Like nature is the thing which we're protecting ourselves against. The world is made of nature and architecture is protecting us from this big thing. But in 2016, that flipped. The thing that defines human life is now architecture because more people live in cities as opposed to urban environments, I mean, rural environments, which means that when most people walk out their front doors, their entire reality is defined by architecture, not by nature. So architecture is no longer the discipline that produces shelters in nature. It's the discipline that provides humankind with the physical backdrop of their reality, which means we need to become more, far more sophisticated about what we're turning this planet into because what the tools we've been using, which like I said, all good ideas, equality, function, industrial production, great ideas, but the way they were deployed produced shitty reality. Architects have produced a shitty reality for humans for over a hundred years. And now I think we're finding a generation of architects that's like enough is enough. Uh, we've grown up in the cities. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, which is your typical American city with a kind of maybe two square blocks of nice downtown, but mostly horrible downtown, horrible suburbs, horrible strip malls, horrible office parks, uh, Applebee's, you know, <laughs> Taco Bell, McDonald's along the strip with 10 drugstores. Our urban environments are just, a, particularly in the United States, which was mostly built in the 20th century, as opposed to Europe, which was significant portions of what were built prior to the 20th century. I just rode my motorcycle from San Francisco to New York City in the middle of COVID because I got a little stir crazy. And I can tell you the American urban landscape is, is, is like a one out of 10. It's like a human disaster that's the cause of, I think, depression, political animosity, grievance, uh, suffering. I think like the world we've produced for ourselves here in the U.S., is 
one of the most depressing human environments ever to emerge within the history of human civilization. And I think architects, particularly American architects, are just like, enough is enough. Like, we got to find a way, new way to do this. And in order, in order to do that, we need a new set of ideas to power what we produce, which is why I think a number of my peers and I are interested in aesthetics, because it's how people perceive the world. It's the philosoph philosophical discourse about how people perceive the world, not how per they perceive concepts. It's about like actual human perception and the pleasure or camaraderie or identity that could be part of that human perception. I think for me, so much of it comes into evolutionary psychology and how the, the environment, the architectural environment, the urban environment, how its aesthetics is, and beauty, I suppose, as well, is that which correlates most favorably through the mechanisms of evolutionary psychology to produce in us and in our in our brains favorable feelings and favorable emotions and it's always amazing to me especially these days with the focus on mental health quite rightly uh, increased focus on mental health how absolutely no one within that world seems to be talking about aesthetics and how the environment affects your mental health and how being immersed as you say so much more urbanism now so many more people are living in cities and urban environments when you're immersed in that 24 hours a day your entire life the emotional effect that has and the psychological effect the aesthetics of that environment has on you has such a huge effect and yet it does not seem to be a topic that's coming up in the mental health sphere or in architecture you know we don't or talk in architecture about, yeah yeah mental I, I i was the chair of admissions at yale for for the architecture school for i think six years or so and like I said, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, which your, your listeners may not know is just right in the center of the U.S. It's, it's flat. There's nothing there. It's the center of the Midwest. It's a city of, I don't know, three or 400,000 people. Um, and it's pretty typical for a Midwestern city in that it has mostly been built probably since 1950. Uh, so it's basically a kind of pseudo-modernist downtown, like corporate modernist downtown with infinite suburbs as far as the eye can see. Um, and I was always curious at Yale why at the time I was, as there, we had students in the school from 40 different countries. So we're only a school of like 200 and maybe 50 students uh, back then. And we had representatives from 40 different countries. And that's kind of astounding figure, right? Uh, but we almost never got applications from where I was from, which is Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Oklahoma, Wyoming, just the center of the United States. And I realized at a certain point that the reason why we didn't get applications from any of these states with any regularity, very, very few, is that in order to be interested in architecture, you have to have seen it. And these cities and these states are largely free of what you and I would consider architecture. They don't have a London nearby to see what architecture looks like. They don't even have a, you know, Manchester or an, an Edinburgh, or, you know, they have, you know, the nearest city, you know, in all those states is the biggest city is like Omaha or Kansas City. So, which has very, very little, very, very little what, what we would call like architecture that has aesthetic qualities. So people weren't applying to architecture school because they'd never seen architecture. And I thought, you know, that's kind of amazing, right? Like even medieval peasants in, uh, you know, England would have seen a cathedral, you know, would have seen a church, would have seen something that linked the idea of a building with something more inspiring than just shelter. And that historically, you know, around the world, I would say most people have had some place which was a special architectural place. But now we've had entire generations of people growing up in areas, myself included, that have never been to a special building, mm -hmm. never encountered a special building to the point where they don't even know really the discipline of architecture is an option. That's very sad. <laughs> That's very sad to me. 
Yeah, no, I I completely agree with that. Um, yeah, like you say, if you've not seen it, then you don't know that there's even the possibility of getting involved yeah. in that world. Yeah. Um, I said I'd ask you about clients. Uh, if I'm playing, let me play devil's advocate for a second. I come along and I say I'm a developer and I want to build a nice new office building, whatever it is. And I come to you and I say, Mark, I'd love to, bu- I'd love to build one of these beautiful buildings with a lovely ornamentation and high resolution and all this kind of thing. But I just no ornamentation, no <laughs> ornamentation, high resolution. <laughs> but I just can't afford to. I've got to, I've got to build my office building. I've got a fifteen percent profit margin. I, I need to pick these products off the shelf i needed a simple concrete frame i need to clad it in the cheapest the most effective cladding i can get my floor area get my margins effective i've got shareholders and executives to answer to i can't go spending loads of money on all this fancy aesthetic stuff how do you win over the client base when they come back and say which they always do it's too expensive it's going to be too expensive i can't do it make it simpler yeah, so architecture always has constraints, right? Like even if you're designing St. Peter's Cathedral, there's constraints on budget, on tectonics, on available materials. I don't think there's any conflict between aesthetics and constraints. I mean, they may come to me and say, I want a building that's, you know, they may point to the project we did on the design for the tower we did on West 57th street that has all these stone elements and stuff. And I'd be, I'd be like, I'd be frank. I'd say, you know, for your budget, you can't get that, but that doesn't mean that I can't design something better for the same budget that you're used to spending. That doesn't mean I can't design something better, even given those constraints. Like I, I, you know, we will often work with companies you know, instead of just buying materials kind of off the shelf, I'm much more interested in working with companies to see what they're capable of producing. I've found that, and we haven't built a lot, mind you, so I'm saying this, you know, with some humility, but uh, when I've gone to a company and said, look, you produce these really interesting panels, or I really like this material, we were wondering if there might be a way to change the way you produce them to do this other thing um for this project would you be interested in collaborating like usually companies are like yeah you want to make our projects better you want to make it more interesting like and we can still do it on the same assembly line like yeah i remember i was doing um a a project and we were working with a cabinet maker and the cabinet maker had a cnc mill that they used to cut out all of the cabinet doors so they just cut it out of the mdf you know so they didn't have to have a guy's you know, there was a saw or whatever. And I was like, we want to do this countertop, this kind of like wavy. And he's like, he's like, oh no, I can't do that. We only cut things out. And I went to his facility, which was out on Long Island, he had like 20 CNC mills. And I was like, you know, you're using a 2D cutting software program, but you know, your mill can move in a third dimension. And he's, he had no idea his mill could move in a third dimension it's just he was using 2d cutting software instead of 3d milling software so i showed him to use the tools he already had that he could do this rippled surface as this countertop and he was like holy shit you know (laughs) you just show people and you're willing to work with them on what they're producing and try to do more interesting or more aesthetically interesting or more aesthetically um compelling versions of what they're already doing. So there's three scenarios where a developer comes to me and says, I want you to do a project. One scenario is he says, I want you to do, he or she says, I want you to do your tower on West 57th street for this budget I have. I would say, I can't do that. You're gonna have to find someone else. I can say, I can do your project. Um, by working with some of these companies with curtain walls and do the best thing that I can aesthetically with the budget you have, which is what we usually do. Or if they would come with a budget where I knew I couldn't do anything, I would say, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. Here's Gensler's business card. They're really good at like knocking out the kind of thing you want to do. I know some people there. They're great people. Here's their number. You know, so those are the options. And we encounter those situations all the time you know we have clients that after meeting with a couple times we just realized like there's not enough wiggle room to do what we want and we just 
you know, we'll refer to them to other architects who can give them the best version of what they want. I'm not judgmental about it. You know, people have budgets. I'm not like one of these that architects that say, you know, you have a budget, but you should care more about humanity in our cities. You should double your budget and give something back to the city. Like, I know how that's, that's not how the world works. But I also think architects are too comfortable with the idea of just designing what they know, drag and dropping the materials they're familiar with and like popping it out because that's a way to generate more profit. I mean, in architecture, the more money you spend on design, the less profit you get. It's kind of a bad business model, but I think I would just say hire architects who actually enjoy design. So, you know, they have a vested interest in what pops out at the other end, rather than just going with a firm that just pops out the same office buildings over and over. Yeah. Or um, the route that I've, the conclusion I come to on this is to do as much development as possible. If you can, starting small, obviously, and, and working on small sure. buildings and working up. Yeah. It affords you that when it's only you that you're accountable to, it affords you the flexibility to experiment and take risks and make mistakes and work work things out as you go along without the fear of being sued by your client. Right. Which is, uh... That's the best, that's the best case <laughs> scenario. But yeah, yeah, I don't well, think architects, you know, I mean, any architect should be able to move beyond um, what the kind of obvious confines are in the of the architectural profession. Like we should be able to do more that just push some boxes around and drag and drop a curtain wall. Like we should be able to do more. So, so yeah, my office is like set up so it doesn't convince clients to spend more money, but we convince clients to go on a journey with us where we try to take their resources and do more with them. Yeah. But that's the history of architecture. I mean, you know, the uh, Ruskin had a budget. You know, Frank Gehry has a budget. Zaha Hadid has a budget. Every great architecture in human history, with the exception of maybe Imhotep, you know, has had a, a budget and constraints they had to work with. So, yeah. Well, I found the other thing with high resolution architecture, as you call it, that you can do is that you, it affords you the ability to have higher tolerances on things because you can use smaller elements to, to cover up gaps between larger elements and so on, yeah. so on and so forth. And that that actually saves you money because the amount of time, like, for example, the time it takes to get a perfect modernist shadow gap or like exactly get this bit of material lined up with that bit of material, it, like the, the precision needed for that is so yeah. time consuming and expensive. Well, yeah. That, 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 I mean, that's the, that's the, there's a, there was a funny, there was a New Yorker cartoon, the New Yorker magazine, and it has this client coming up to an architect and says, I want, I want to do something very, very minimal. And the architect says, minimalism, you can't afford minimalism. <laughs> and it's, like, <laughs> it's true. I mean, classicism as a language, at least for something like a New York apartment is way cheaper than doing a modernist apartment for the same reason that you articulate. Like you can either get a perfectly flat floor and a perfectly flat wall and have a perfectly standardized quarter inch gap between them. Or you can have a sloppy floor and a sloppy wall and just put a baseboard to cover up the joint. Same thing with the ceiling. You can have a sloppy wall and a sloppy ceiling and classical architecture, you'd always have a cornice that covers up the gap, right? So the cornice seems like it would cost more money because it's carved wood and all it goes all the way around. But actually classicism has a built-in system of covering up its mistakes because the joints in classicism are always highly articulated to take attention away from the fact that they're not imperfect. So I think you're right. I mean, I think there's these assumptions that we have to move beyond in architecture that a white box with a glass curtain wall is necessarily like the most efficient way of doing things. Yeah, I used to work on the, some of the sort of Georgian and Victorian buildings in London, some of the most beautiful ones. And it always amazed me, once you strip back the layers, how slapdash some of the construction was and how badly oh and quickly yeah. it was put together. Yeah. It's, it's slightly reassuring in a way because it makes you feel less bad when you see builders doing it these days. Yeah, no, it's such a good point. I mean, it's like, yeah, way cheaper to, to do sloppier construction with some technique that covers it up. And it's so funny. It's like architects will spend a million dollars to get that consistent quarter inch shadow gap in a New York city apartment, which I've done, you know, we finished an apartment that was sold for $20 million. So we spent a lot of time on that like shadow gap and 
I'm pretty convinced if, you know, we didn't have that shadow gap gap and the, the wall just met the ground and it, you know, it was a couple gaps or the client probably wouldn't even notice at all. So the architects spend a massive amount of money to get to the architectural resolution of things that's only appreciated by other architects. You could spend that money and spend it on a type of resolution that everyone would enjoy. Like, so would you rather, would your mom rather look at a beautifully CNC carved stone doorway, not traditional, but in some, you know, my language, or would they rather look at a building with perfect shadow gaps? You know, is yeah. people, are people going to take pictures of a beautiful doorway that you spend more money or in really consistent shadow gaps? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Well, on the subject of sort of moving the, the state of the profession forward, I suppose, if you are a student of undergrad or postgrad student or a recent graduate who's stuck in a or, well I say stuck who's working in a practice at a sort of junior level doing basic kind of stuff what can you do if you've been taught this the sort of the the modernist the 20th century way your whole architectural education career and you're now working for someone who has that view what can you do at an individual level to actually start to push back to make a difference or to start to try to advance the the arguments on your sort of personal level well i mean i guess it depends where you are in the office but certainly you need a certain degree of i don't know power is not the right word but you need to have some control over the design to have any impact on the design right so if you're an intern at you know, Norman Foster's office, odds are you're not going to be like, Norman, I got this great idea <laughs> for a skyscraper. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, I always think of this. Uh, I, I love this little building. I, I taught a studio with Frank Gehry a number of years ago at Yale about the same time he was doing this building on the West Side Highway here in New York uh, for Barry Diller, the ICA building. And what was interesting is he was just using a glass curtain wall. And just to use as an example, this like, imagine this is a piece of glass and you know he wanted to do something different without using these flat glass pieces and he realized he went to the glass manufacturer and realized that the glass could torque like ever so slightly and still have all of its warranties and all of its insurances and they wouldn't have to make it any different they make the glass flat and they just pull a corner of a back, back of it and attach it to the frame so it's just ever so slightly it was like working within the tolerances, but over the course of the whole building, they gave the building this like really beautiful kind of more robust curvature, not because he was CNC and milling or anything or doing anything like fancy with casting glass and these weird shapes. It just, someone in the office took the time to call the manufacturer and say, you know, is there any tolerance on how much we can bend the glass before it attaches to the frame and the person was like yeah I, you know we, look, we can we can do it like three percent turns out that it ended up being stronger for the company because it was torqued it had higher hurricane resistance because it was bowed outward ever so slightly didn't cost any more money uh it was entirely in their existing um tolerances for construction and was able to produce a building which was kind of like has this beautiful curve that goes up the side. And I always think about that when I think, you know, that wasn't, you know, Frank Gary that like called up the glass manufacturer. That was some like intern who got assigned like finding materials and was probably like, let me just think about this a little bit more for five more minutes. Is there a way to do this thing with this product? Can I just take that extra 10 minutes and like do a sketch and call the manufacturer? And I think if you're at a big firm, and you're assigned to do something, there may be opportunities where you can say, hey, listen, you know, I'm gonna take 20 more minutes and think about this a little bit more and maybe make a few calls and go to my boss and say, hey, look, I discovered this thing that instead of using it like they normally use it, what if we do this? What if we do something different? You just have to be, I don't know, maybe take a little bit of ambition and not be afraid to propose new ideas as long as they're within the confines of what the firm normally does. That changes the higher you go up the food chain that I think as you go higher up the food chain and have more contacts with clients, you can get the clients interested in, you know, I've always found that 
there's a type of client that just wants to come give you as little money as possible and pop out a building and get it. Um, and then there's a client, which I've found is most clients that are actually really interested in the process and they want to be made part of the process and they want to, they want to kind of do something that no one else has done before if it doesn't cost them any more money. And I think you just have to be like interested in finding clients that are willing to go on a little bit of journey with you and not think of you as a vending machine where you pop in a quarter and you get out of building. I think, you know, architects and clients should have a little clients should have maybe a little bit more interested in what the architects are doing. And I've always found that clients find it very exciting to be involved in the design process and learn about those things. And if they're not, you know, maybe they're not the right client for your office, but certainly need to have architects that are interested in innovating and clients that are interested in innovating, but innovation doesn't always coincide with the need to spend more money. Yeah. And if you're a student, if you're sat in undergrad or postgrad and you're being taught the old way, the abstract abstraction way, and you're more, you want to get into high resolution architecture and start exploring it, how would you recommend people best do that? Well, certainly, um, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, everything I've written is pretty much available for free <laughs> on the website. If you're in, if they're interested in aesthetics, if they're interested in learning about the intellectual side of things, I mean, I think it helps. I, I personally, all of my ideas in architecture come from philosophy and ideas. Uh, I'm not one of those people that's like inspired by a piece of coral or something. You know, <laughs> like I was inspired by a dolphin. I, I'm, I get most of my ideas from reading certain things, which may, make me think differently about architecture. So I would say you just start by reading and being exposed to different ideas. And those are going to push you in different directions. They don't have to be my ideas, but there's a lot of new writing about aesthetics related to architecture available today. Um, and I would also just say that architects, especially younger architects in offices, should you know keep abreast of what's happening in the world of architecture by architects closer to your own age. Like I think there's a tendency in architecture magazines for them to publish newest building by Norman Foster and newest building by Jean Nouvel, newest building by, and those are great architects. And, uh, you know, you can learn a lot from their projects, but at the same time, they're, you know, Norman Foster was educated in the fifties you know, and the sixties, <laughs> same as Jean Nouvel, like find out what the architects are doing who are educated in 2010 and what are they talking about and how can you be part of that conversation? Like you can't develop new ideas and new architecture in a vacuum. You have to be part of a larger conversation. So I would say be part of that larger conversation by reading and being exposed to new ideas and be part of that conversation by being aware of the people in architecture who are doing things um, in kind of like a more emerging milieu that are maybe of a similar age to you that you can relate to more, that you can access more easily that you could have a conversation with just you know get get involved in the kind of i would say i don't know if i want to call it a movement but get involved in the movement of architecture that's moving towards a kind of more aesthetic desirability less abstraction less intellectual and conceptual jargon and just kind of expose yourself to that world but it's, you know, it's, it's not like you just take a class and you're all of a sudden, a, I don't know, contemporary architect. It's just, you have to be interested in it and you have to be willing to kind of participate in it. And I think there's a lot of outlets for participation, probably even more so for young architects, given their exposure to social media and ways that they can learn about things that way. So, yeah. Liam, yeah. Get reading everyone. Right. Get reading, go online, learn some things talk about these ideas with your peers. And I think you'll be surprised in how much that actually makes you more valuable to the firms you work for because you're coming at things with a different perspective that other people don't have. Brilliant. Well, Mark Postergage, thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much. It's been great. Enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.